Hi, everybody. This is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I am so pleased today to have John Graft and Marty Durham with me from Butler Tech in Ohio. Butler Tech is one of my favorite educational entities in the entire world, and they're kind of a hard to describe, so I'm going to let them do that themselves. Um, and we're really, really looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, John and Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, here. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead and launch and just sort of Tell us a little bit about what Butler Tech is. Yeah, so um, Marty and I are excited to be here today. Uh, Butler Tech is a, a public high school in uh, just north of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we are made up of around, we are made up of 11 school districts in our region. Um, we have six campuses that include both uh, secondary programs as well as adult education programs. We run the gamut of a variety of different types of programs from a school of the arts, to a bioscience center, to a natural science center, to our D. Russell Lee campus, which is uh, skilled manufacturing, IT, mechatronics, uh, fire, police academies for high school students. Um, we also have a natural science center where we have equine science, veterinary science, landscape architecture, and then we have two adult education campuses as well that we focus on industrial maintenance, uh, HVAC welding for adult education students as well as a fire and police academy. A population of secondary students, uh, we have about 23, 25% of our students are students with special needs. Uh, our diversity of our population and our associate schools, uh, we have very urban areas, uh, high uh, urban areas to very rural uh, locations. We have a heavy um, Appalachia uh, concentration of, of families that live in our area, as well as a diversity of uh, 30% of our students, uh, either African American, Latino, multiracial. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a wide variety with about 25% uh, of our students on free and reduced lunch. Awesome. So, John, you got a lot of stuff going on. Roughly how many staff, how many students? Um, yeah, so we have about uh, 500 staff members total. Um, we also have what are called satellite programs that we put into our 11 associate schools. So 200 of our staff members are uh, uh, in our satellite programs. Uh, but our high school campuses, uh, we have uh, just a little over 100 teachers uh, throughout our campuses doing a variety of different uh, programming. Awesome. And then our population, we have about, we serve 17,000 students in a year's time. That's fantastic. Thanks. So I, I love the mix of your own schools, you're embedded in other people's schools, you're working with adults, you're working with business partners. So the reason I've been really excited to talk to you all, just other than because I just like you all so much, is because um, I'm really interested in how you all transitioned to remote, right? Like, how do you do all this good hands-on work often with equipment, right? And then how do you shift that into a, some kind of remote instructional setting? So what, what has Butler Tech done over the last couple months? Well, um, I'd like to address that. If we, you know, it's always about mindset. And so we transitioned into, okay, let's look at the whole child. Um, and like Scott, you were sharing, students are coming to us for that hands-on experience. But we had to look at the whole child first and we did surveys, we did um, phone conversations with every student trying to reach out and say, what is your need for food? What is your need for babysitting? Um, are you still working full time? What does your family need you to do? Um, and then of course we wanted to meet students where they were um, and meet all of those needs first. And so once you figure out where the students are, then we had to talk about teacher expectations what was their family situation and what was happening. And then from there, we had to talk about what are our expectations as educators right now, as far as assessing students, um, also workload. And then through our research, we found that most students did not log on, log on until 10 p.m. <laughs> right? Because they get through work or their family obligations and they're logging on from 10 until 1 a.m., which we were, like, whoa, this changes everything. But in that model, like you were sharing, our instructors had to be extremely creative in pulling business partners in and having these virtual experiences on talking through entrepreneurship, but doing it through Zoom. Um, 
I know through personal experience with my son who had physics, he was doing science experiments in our kitchen. Um, and then we were doing online classes, everything that tied to our fifth day experience where students were going to school four days and on that fifth day choosing what they wanted for their mental health and wealth and to move forward. But we had everything from martial arts um, so that they could get physical and get connected to Chef Simpson did online classes on, hey, what's in your kitchen? Throw out what's in your kitchen on the counter and let's figure it out so you can cook for your family. <laughs> so we try to utilize everything we had from fifth day experience um, to, I guess, address mental health issues that we may have had going on with anxiety around everyone um, not being comfortable with this new situation. And also, we had to bring a sense of humor into this. So we had a lot of theme Zooms, and teachers got really creative about, you know, my hair's grown out, or we had um, teachers doing lessons down by the river, <laughs> um, just to keep student interest. You talk about having to do that on a normal basis, and we have a really good edge on doing that with all of our wonderful labs. But now it's like, what is going to catch their attention to get them engaged during these Zoom conversations? Um, some of our students we found thrived in this situation that we didn't realize they would do. And some of them what the students call ghosted. So the teachers are reporting that their relationships with families have been stronger than they ever have. Because teachers are reaching out to families saying, we just wanna make sure he's okay. And then it starts this relationship about expectations. No, I'm gonna get them all in line and I am gonna expect this right now. So it confirms what we've always known is one size does not fit all. And so what we've already been driving towards is protect your plan as a student, an individualized, individualized plan as a student so that we have a decision day at the end of the year for every single child to celebrate what their path is. It's not just a signing day for academics or a signing day for athletics. It's got to be a decision day where we're personalizing their education. And so we're asking students right now, how do you choose to show mastery? And then we'll adapt to you. Um, so this was really not about how do we do something new, it's just further research for what we already know um, and changing those mindsets of the adults involved to ensure that, you know, through student showcases, students were doing that online as well of here's what I learned and let me show you how I learned it and let me think metacognition of thinking about my thinking during this process. So it really has been an opportunity for us to say, we know no, not all, you know, all situations fit every kid. So now how do we use this research and this model to show everybody that it should be a part of our everyday lives? So when, when John, it hits me that um, you have a number of features of Butler Tech that have served you really well right, um, that maybe more traditional schools don't have. You've got an emphasis on flexibility and adaptability, uh, high levels of student agency and ownership of their own learning. You've got a focus on competencies and mastery and personalized pathways, right? So it feels like um, that has allowed you to shift more easily than, you know, another school that might have more of, like you said, a one-size-fits-all model. So what are some lessons that you think other schools can take away from Butler Tech's approach? <laughs> Pandemic or no? <laughs> yeah, um, well really, what I would say is that in a crisis, your, the culture of your organization will, will come to the forefront. So if you have a healthy organization and a healthy culture, um, your organization will thrive uh, during those crises. They will rally around each other and, and really help one another out. So, you know, our, our organizational norms, uh, the acronym we use is EMPOWER. And so really knowing that we had to make some of these decisions very, very quickly, because we basically had two days to mobilize and transform basically what our model was going to be with students no longer there on our campuses. Um, we made the conscious decision because our norms say that we're all collective thought leaders 
we had to continue to empower our teaching staff, our administrators, and our students to say, um, do everything you can, knowing that there are situations that uh, you, the student may be the only essential worker in the home at this point in time because mom and dad or mom or grandma or whomever they live with has been laid off. Um, do everything you can to support the student, support the whole child. And if you base your decision making about that and you empower others to do that, um, I think you have a stronger and a healthier organization. And students are much more resilient than teachers and organizations are. So if you do a lot of listening to them as to what they need and you respond to them, uh, I think um, that has been, that has come to the forefront about how our organization uh, honors that uh, with our students. Mm -hmm. Teacher feedback has been, thank you for trusting us. Nice. Yeah. So uh, other decisions that you all made that you think worked well? Uh, well, he, it, it, it's funny that, um, you know, at Butler Tech, we, we had always, because risk taking was one of the things that we put into our norms, uh, that's the R in the empower, uh, is risk taking. And we've always sort of joked around that we were going to be 80% ready for something that we were going to do, and then we were going to announce it. And so we did that with fifth day experience. And it was, you know, it was sort of became a joke because it forced us to finish the other 20%. I know, uh, Dr. McLeod, you've probably been a part of organizations that you get to a place where you feel like, hey, we're close, but everybody wants to finish all the details before you mobilize. And I think if you announce it publicly and saying you're doing it, you're forced to do the other 20%. I think with this situation, the percentage changed for us. So it was, we had about 60% of the information and we said, okay, well, we have to announce it because we have no other choice. So we've been doing online learning since 2005. Our students had one-to-one -one computers. We have a lot of advantages when it came to that. Uh, but I also think that um, our unique lab experiences was something that we had to figure out how we were gonna make that mobile. And we, I know that teaching machining is not what I'm gonna be able to teach. And so I need to rely upon the machining teacher, the precision machining teacher to say, you go about and share with your students how to best translate that to them virtually. And, the, and our teachers responded and our staff and students responded as well. Marnie, I'm not sure if you wanna to add to that. No, we're in the 60% range. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, it's just about collective efficacy. Right, that we have that shared belief. That's one of our norms as well. Um, and we really believe that this is going to change the teaching model as far as um, team teaching. So how do you infuse those academics into the lab? Because in the fall, if we do have a hybrid model um, and we only have students for two to three days, how do we ensure all of the academics We've always preached that, but this is really saying we have to do this now, um, which is a much better situation for students to have their math concepts coupled with the whole reason they came to Butler Tech in mechatronics and not have a separate class. And so it's really changing our instructional model for the good um, and making our time together more efficient. Awesome. Uh Challenges, considerations moving forward, things you're thinking about over the summer or for the fall? <laughs> yeah, so um, the challenges are coming up with a variety of scenarios of what might happen in August. You know, whether we're going to be uh, back full go and, and students are going to be on our campuses full time, whether we're going to do a hybrid model um, or whether we're going to go back to fully online. And so I think we have to come up with all three of those scenarios. I think part of our excitement, one, um, is that um, relaxing the rules, so to speak, from school and institution of school has given us freedom to say, okay, well, what will we design knowing that we don't have the constrictions of rules and regulations because those have really been relaxed. And so our heavy push is going to be, we don't wanna go back to the old model. We don't wanna go back to the old way that school use is perceived 
as a sit and get model. And, and we, we abandoned that years ago, but now it's sort of like, okay, now they've released, they've released us from those other constrictions and we're gonna push really, really hard at saying, this is the way we're going to do it because we know the results that our students are getting uh, because they've relaxed the rules and testing and then you have to be in your seat so to speak to learn which isn't necessarily true marnie what are your thoughts uh, and i know john and i um have talked to this has changed our role in the community um you know when they needed ppe supplies and they needed someone to do 3d printing for masks or whatever that is what is our role in the community now where it used to be a challenge to prove to everyone how essential we were or how essential we are, um, those walls are starting to break down and they're like, oh, did anyone reach out to that school? You know, because they have all that equipment and they have all those supplies. So that challenge of always making sure that we're seen as a stakeholder in the community is also starting to diminish. diminish. But like John said, it's just, we cannot go backwards. We have to keep giving these examples and push forward of how an educational institution is not, you know, a, a side item. It truly is that we've woven into the fabric of a community. So you have always been so innovative. I'm trying to imagine removing your fences and what a scary, amazing thing that is going to be for your area of Ohio. I can't wait to see what happens. John, Marnie, thank you so much for spending thank some you. time with me today. Thank okay. you.